Good morning. Welcome to worship, whether here in person or online. It is great to have you with us this morning. We hope that you had a blessed Veterans Day on Thursday. And again, remember to thank all the veterans in our lives who have served uh, presently or have served in the past. So we remember them uh, this day. Again, it's great to have you in worship with us this morning. We're going to begin with our opening song. Great God of wonders, giver of life, giver of praise, creator of everything before us. You had me in mind before the stars were in place. Your love surpasses all my flaws. Praising you for all you are The reason we're here and the reason we sing Is to thank you, O oh God, and give praise to the King We lift up our hands and we lift up our eyes and we sing You are holy Father of love of mercy What have I done that you would think about me You've taken my shame You've taken my sorrow Replaced them with life and life abundantly Your love surpasses all my you for all you are. The reason we're here and the reason we sing is to thank you, O oh God, and give praise to the King. We lift up our hands and we lift up our eyes and we sing. You are holy. The reason we're here and the reason we sing is to thank you, O oh God, and give praise to the King. We lift up our hearts and we lift up our minds. We pray that all we do would bring glory to you. You can see inside my heart. You can see inside my mind. So strip away the things that leave me deaf and blind. The reason we're here and the reason we sing is to thank you, O oh God. And give praise to the King We lift up our hands And we lift up our eyes And we sing You are holy The reason we're here And the reason we sing Is to thank you, O God And give praise to the King We lift up our hearts And we lift up our minds And we pray that all we do Would bring glory to you Would bring glory to you. Once again, welcome to worship. Whether online or here in person, it is a pleasure to have you in worship with us this morning. I invite you to join with me in our opening prayer. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we know that you invited us to be here in this place together to hear your word, to know your promises, to invite us to live this new life that you have in store for us. Let us know that you welcome us just the way we are. You welcome us with our doubts, our fears, our uncertainties, our unbeliefs. You welcome us and you reveal to us your love and grace. Bless us as we gather here today. May we hear your voice, may we be assured of your love, and may we experience the power of your grace in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to join with me in our call to worship. You'll see your response up on the screen. With grateful hearts, with grateful and expected hearts, 
We gather to give our hearts, minds, souls, and all our energy in adoration to God. With grateful and expected hearts, we gather to praise God who gives living water through whom the faithful flourish. Those who trust in you, O God, are like trees planted by the water. Those who place their faith in you are like trees with deep roots. Those who receive their life from you are like green trees during a drought. We praise you, God, for the life that has no end. Through Jesus, our risen Savior. Which comes from Luke chapter 10, beginning at verse 25. An expert in the law, Moses, stood up and asked Jesus a question to see what he would say. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to have eternal life? Jesus answered, what is written in the scripture? How do you understand them? The man replied, the scripture says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. They also say, love your neighbors as much as you love yourself. Jesus said, you, must have, you have given the right answer. If you do this, you will have eternal life. But the man wanted to show that he knew what he was talking about. So he asked Jesus, who are my neighbors? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Robbers attacked him, grabbed him, grabbed everything he had. They beat him up and ran off, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down that same road, but when he saw the man, he walked by on the other side. Later, a temple helper came to the same place, but when he saw the man who had been beaten up, he also went by on the other side. A man from Samaria then came traveling down the road. When he saw the man, he felt sorry for him. He went over to him. He treated his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put them, him on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next morning he gave the innkeepers two silver coins and said, Please take care of the man. If you spend more than this on him, I will pay you when I return. Then Jesus asked, Which one of these three people was a real neighbor to the man who was beaten up by robbers? The expert in the law of Moses answered, The one who showed pity. Jesus said, Go and do the same. Here is the word of God. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, open our hearts, our minds, our very beings to your presence. May we hear this calling in our lives to follow you into this world of brokenness and pain and there experience your grace and life. In Jesus' name, amen. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. A local business was looking for office help, like so many businesses today. So they put up a sign in the window, help wanted. Must be able to type, must be a good with computers, and must be bilingual. We are an equal opportunity employer. Well, after a short while, a dog happens to trot by the window, looks up at the sign, and goes inside. He looks at the receptionist and begins to wag his tail. Then he walks over the sign and looked at it and whined. Getting the idea, the receptionist called in the office manager. The office manager looked at the dog and was surprised, to say the least, but he says, come on in. Let's see what's going on. So he brings him back to his office. The dog jumps in the seat, staring at the office manager. The office manager said, I, I can't hire you. The sign says you have to be able to type. Well, immediately the dog jumps down off the chair, runs over to the typewriter, sits down, and begins to type out a perfectly formatted and grammatically correct letter and hands it back to the office manager. Well, the office manager was impressed, but he says, I, I still can't hire you. You have to be good at computers. Well, again, the dog jumps down off the chair, runs over to the computer, logs in, happens to know the password, 000, logs in, formats a great Excel spreadsheet, does some database work, and hands it back to the office manager. Oh, <laughs> again, the office manager goes, you are amazing, but, but I still can't hire you. 
Well, again, the dog jumps down off the chair, runs over to the flyer, and whines at an equal opportunity employer. Goes back to the chair, looks at the office manager. Office manager says, I completely understand that. You are an amazing dog. Your intelligence is be beyond my imagination. You have amazing skills, but I still can't hire you. It says right there, you have to be bilingual. The dog looks at the office manager. Meow. Help wanted. You see those signs all over, don't you? Help wanted. We know that there are many businesses who are struggling to find the help they need in order to do their business. And some businesses are even closing. Help wanted. And this morning, we hear the story of the good Samaritan, someone who helps out. Now, this is a story that is familiar to most of us. This is a story you've heard over and over again, oftentimes in your life. And you know we're supposed to be good neighbors. And my guess is all of you are sitting here right now going, well, I'm a pretty good neighbor. And you are. This congregation is very generous when it comes to needs in this community. You support a food bank that continues to serve those in need in our community. When there's a, something that needs to be done, you as a congregation are willing to step up. You are a good neighbor. I know you take care of each other. You take of those in your community. And I would guess some of you are saying, you know, I can just kind of close my eyes on this one and just kind of relax. I'll wait for the next song and then I can re-engage because I kind of know this. I'm feeling pretty good about this one, Jesus. I am a good neighbor. Well, is that what Jesus is talking about this morning? Because most of us could say that we're probably pretty decent neighbors. If our neighbor's garage door is open, we may call them up and say, hey, your garage door is left open. If your neighbor needs some food, you're probably going to get them food. Some of you even may have keys to your neighbors that you can get in and out of so that if there's a problem, you have access to their house. Being a good neighbor is good, but is that really all that God wants from us? So let's look at this story again, maybe. So the beginning of the story is there's a man who is an expert in the law of Moses. So that means he knows the law. He knows the Jewish law. He knows the commandments, love your Lord, your God. He knows the call to love your neighbor as yourself. And when he asks Jesus, what must I do? And Jesus says, what do you think? He quotes scripture. Love God, love neighbor. I'm done. And we're told that he wants to add a little bit more, doesn't he? Not only does he want to get the right answer, but he wants to show him, Jesus and everyone else he really knows what he's talking about. But who is my neighbor? The man asks. And Jesus tells this story. Jesus tells the story of a man who was up in Jerusalem. Jerusalem's about 2,800 feet above sea level. So that's why you always go up to Jerusalem. So whenever you hear scripture, you always say they go up to Jerusalem because Jerusalem is up the hill. So you always go up no matter where you are in Israel. Jerusalem's up here at 2,800 feet. Jericho's down here at 853 feet below sea level. So it's a descent. You're moving down quickly. And along this road is a lot of opportunities for you to be robbed. There are places where people can hide and jump out at you. So it is a fairly dangerous road between Jerusalem and Jericho. And we're told a man is traveling down by himself, and sure enough, robbers. And there they are. They grab him. They rob him. They beat him. And they leave him for dead. This is the main character in the story, isn't he? 
He's what begins the story. This man laying on the road, left for dead. And now some other characters enter the scene. First comes down a priest. Now this priest has probably been up at the temple serving the sacrifices. You see in this time in Israel's history, there would be priests that live in other parts of Israel and they would be assigned a time to go and offer the sacrifices. So it had been his time. And because he's coming down from Jerusalem, he's fulfilled his obligation. He's offered the sacrifices. His wife is waiting for him at home. Dinner is on the table. The kids are anxious. And he's trying to hurry home before it gets dark. And he's coming down the road. And my guess is as he's walking on the road, he sees something up in front. You ever done that? You kind of, what is that? I wonder what that is. Maybe at first he thinks it's a rock, or maybe he just thinks it's a bunch of clothes kind of gathered together. But as he gets closer, it appears that he begins to see that it's another person. And what does he do? We're told he moves (laughs) to the other side. He goes from one side of the road to the other, away from that man. Have you ever done that? You're in a hurry? You've been at the grocery store, you're in a hurry, and you got dinners on the t- almost on the table, you had to pick up a couple items, and then you see that person. And you know, if I see that person, that person sees me, I'm going to be here another 20 minutes. You been there? And what do you do? You go down a different aisle, right? Right? We've all done it, right? We just don't have time. It's nothing against them, but my... My spouse is going to be upset. Dinner's going to be ruined. I don't have time for this. And I go a different way. Or maybe you're walking down the street and you see something go, that doesn't look right. And you go, I'm going to go a different path. I just don't want to get involved. If we're all honest, we've all done that. Because those interruptions in our lives can be overwhelming. Sometimes we just don't have the emotional energy to deal with it. And we try to avoid it. We go around the other side. We can empathize with the priest. He's been working all week. He misses his family. He needs to get home. He doesn't want to be bothered. So he goes to the other side. And now, we have a temple worker. This temple worker has probably been helping the priest. Probably been gathering the collections, making sure the sacrifices are in order, making sure that temple tax has been paid, and his time is done, and he too is going home. And he does exactly the same thing. He moves to the other side and goes on his journey. It's interesting that Jesus picks these two individuals. So on one side, we have the expert in the law, Moses. <laughs> and then on the other side, we have those who represent the Jewish worship system. Both are being lifted up as people who are supposed to know what God is wanting, but yet doesn't seem to see God's work at hand. We have them on one side of the equation, and then we have a new person show up. A man from Samaria. Now, why could have this just been someone who lives in Jerusalem? Why could have this just been another carpenter? Jesus likes carpenters, right? Why could it just be an average person who just happens to be coming down? Why could this person be like one of us? A member of hope was coming down the hill. Why a Samaritan? If the only thing that Jesus is trying to tell us is treat your neighbor nicely, it could have been anyone, right? It could have been anyone. But Jesus doesn't use just anyone. Jesus uses a man from Samaria. Now, who is a man from Samaria? Where is Samaria? Well, if you look on the map of Jesus' day, Samaria is that northern part of Israel. 
See, Samaria used to be a part of the kingdom of Israel. But the north and the south, they break off. And the north, we're told, gets defeated by the Assyrians. And when the Assyrians came in and defeated the people, what they did was they took everyone who had any sense of success and they moved them somewhere else. And they left behind the poorest of the poor. And then they bring people in from other parts of the kingdom who did not know the language, did not know how to succeed in the land, and put them there so they didn't have the energy to rebel. They simply tried to live their life. And guess what? They intermarried. <laughs> because they lived it by each other. And these once part of the Israel's kingdom now are mixing with other countries. They're mixing different traditions. And the Jews saw them as outcasts, as unclean, as unworthy. And we see the Samaritans show up again and again and again in Jesus' life. And here again, a Samaritan shows up. And the Samaritan's walking down. He too is, and we're not sure if he's going up or down, are we? He's just walking along the road. And instead of responding to this Man laying on the road as some inconvenience, we're told the man has pity on him. He's almost drawn to this man laying on the side of the road. Why was he being drawn? What about the Samaritan and that man left half dead drew each other together? Did they both understood at that moment what it meant to be the outsider, the outcast, the left behind, the beaten? Did it that Samaritan man see in that just lump of humanity himself? Did he see someone else who the religious authorities just left behind? not worthy of God's attention. And we're told the man is drawn to that, to that man laying along the road, and he takes care of him. He treats his wounds. He puts him on his donkey. He takes him to an end. He cares for him all night, and he pays for his future care. And then he leaves. <laughs> Think about who else has been beaten Betrayed, left for dead. Doesn't that sound a lot like Jesus? <laughs> Did Jesus get beaten and betrayed and left in a tomb good as dead? And yet somehow, somehow Jesus does not stay dead. Somehow Jesus, through that event, brings about new life, destroys the power of death. But Jesus tells us to take up our crosses and follow him. A cross in which Jesus was denied, betrayed, beaten, and left for dead. Could not this Samaritan story be a reminder to us? It's more than simply helping my neighbor. It's identifying in my neighbor, in my neighbor's brokenness, that I see myself. That I see myself in the brokenness of humanity. I see myself when I look at that person sitting on the street asking for money. I see myself... I know, but for the grace of God, that could be me. Or tomorrow it could be. One of the amazing things, if you ever worked with people in shelters and things like that, when you hear their stories, part of you becomes terrified because you hear in their story your own story. A decision here, an event here, and there you are. You see, sisters and brothers, we're all just trying to survive. We're all just trying to live the best life that we can. 
Jesus is inviting us to have pity on one another. <laughs> because Jesus has said pity on us. Jesus has given up all his glory to become one of us. To show us the way of faith is to have pity on one another. We're just trying, aren't we? The best that we can. And some of us have some big hurdles to get over. I am amazed when I hear people's stories that they're even setting up. I can't imagine the strength that they must have to step each day, but they do. And I'm thankful for my life, but I also know that I need to see in their life my own struggles. That this Samaritan saw in that man left for dead where eternal life is found. Because remember, that's the question. <laughs> the question is, where do you find life? You find it when we have pity on one another. We find it when we understand in each other's lives is somehow our life. We live it when we discover this great mystery that we have a God that is laying along the side of the road with us when we feel abandoned and left for dead. A God that would not leave us there, <laughs> but a God that loves us back to life. We have a God that understands and has pity on us and invites us to have pity on one another to see our humanity, and to experience Jesus' presence. Jesus used the Good Samaritan because the Good Samaritan knew what it was like to be an outcast. And my guess, all of us at times of our lives know what it feels like to be an outcast, <laughs> to be left behind. Let us see in the other that same pity God had on us. For this week, I've invited you to send out thank yous. Last week, I invited you to send out thank yous to those people in your lives, and I hope you had a chance whether you actually were able to send it or at least think about who is it that's been influential in your life. This week, I invite you to think about what community organizations in our community, locally, who are doing the works of God by walking beside those who have been left behind, those who are outcasts. And I invite you just to write them a thank you. Thank you for being willing to take care of those that are often overseen or forgotten about. Thank you for filling the gaps of people's lives. If you're not sure who those organizations are, there is a sheet on the table as you leave the worship space this morning with a, some suggestions. Women's Children's Alliance, people who are dealing with people with addictions, people homelessness, lots of things. There's a lots of needs in our community, aren't there? There's plenty of people to have pity on, to feel a deep emotional connection to their plight. That's what it means to have pity. Not sorry, pity to identify with their brokenness. I invite you to write them a thank you. I'm sure a lot of those places don't get thanked very often, but they do amazing work. And I invite you to, to think about that and thank them that they are doing the work of the Good Samaritan. They are doing the work of filling the gaps, a feeling that we can't just do individually, but together we can Jesus says, what does it make, take to have eternal life? It's to be the Samaritan, <laughs> to see the outcast, to identify and to have pity. And there, sisters and brothers, is life. Amen. Let us pray. Grace and loving God, again, just thank you. Thank you that you had pity on us. Thank you that you see our brokenness. You know when we have been betrayed. You know when we have been forgotten. You know when we have been an outcast. We know when we have been left behind. As good as dead. And you will not leave us there. 
You come and rescue us. You save us. You lead us into life. And you invite us to lead others in that same journey so that together we may all celebrate the feast that has no end where tears are wiped away and joy is restored. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll have, now have our next song.
At this time, we get the joy of affirming together our faith. You'll see the words up on the screen. Let us affirm together. We believe that we are the light of the world. We believe that we should let our light shine before others so that they may see our good works and give glory to our Father in heaven. We believe that we should love be genuine. We believe that we should hate what is evil and that we should hold fast to what is good. We believe that if we live by the Spirit, we should also be guided by the Spirit. We believe in the church, the body of Christ that is active in the world today to bring reconciliation and justice and to announce the good news of God's love and forgiveness. We believe we should not become conceited compete against one another or envy one another. We believe that we should clothe ourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. We believe that we are called to live lives that are self-controlled, upright, and godly while we wait for the blessed hope and the manifestation of the glory of our great God and Savior. Jesus Christ. Amen. At this time is an opportunity for us to lift up before God our very lives, those places where we feel broken or left behind, and to lift up those situations in our world and in our lives where God's grace and love needs to be experienced more fully. At the end of each petition, I will say, God of all blessings, I invite you to respond. We give thanks. We give you thanks. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, it is so easy at times to continue just to walk on, to miss the opportunities to share your love and grace with one another. Our lives at times seem so busy, so stressed. We want to care for one another, but... It just seems too much. But we are reminded again and again that your grace continues to flow over us. Allow us through your love and grace to have pity and compassion on one another. To see in the other our own vulnerabilities, our own brokenness. To realize that it's through your love and through your forgiveness that lives are transformed not only their lives, but our own lives. Help us, O oh God, to reach out to those who are in need, those who are left behind, those who are on the road left for dead. And may we share the life we have in you and the life that you have to offer. God of all blessings, we give you thanks. We pray this day, O oh God, for the world. We are reminded of those parts of the world that continue to be broken and devastated. We pray for the conflict in the Baltic states. We pray for the conflict that's, that's affecting Ethiopia. We pray as nations rattle sabers against one another. And we pray, oh God, that level heads and not mistakes would happen that would cause more violence or potential wars. We pray, O God, for all those who are left behind in those conflicts, those who are caught in the middle, those whose lives are disrupted, those who are simply trying to survive. We pray, O God, as the nations got together to deal with climate issues, we pray for wisdom there and for resolve as they made decisions that somehow working together we can deal with some of the crises we are facing as a world. We pray, O God, this day for those parts of the world that have been devastated by drought and famine, those lives that are torn apart by the threats of war. We just lift up your world to you, O God. Let us be instruments of your grace and your healing. God of all blessings, we give you thanks. 
We pray this day, O oh God, for our communities. We thank you, O oh God, this week for all those who served in our military or our, our law enforcement or first responders, those who are willing to risk their lives in protections of others. We just lift them up to you, O oh God, this day, and especially those who gave their lives. May you give hope and peace to their families. And we pray, O oh God, for those who are separated from their families because of military service at this time, especially during the holidays. Watch over them, and we long for them to be able to return. We pray, O oh God, this day for our communities. We pray for our schools as they are preparing for the holiday breaks here in a couple weeks and then again in December. We pray for teachers as they're navigating this difficult time, students and parents as we come together to figure out how best to teach our children and also to keep them safe. We pray for our hospitals as they are getting better but still are overwhelmed. And all those who are facing operations that are put on hold because there's no room for them. There's no ability for them to get the care they need. We pray for doctors and nurses and all those who work in the health care that you would watch over them and guide them. We pray, O oh God, for our communities that the anger that's so expressed so often may lessen, that we may see in each other not the threat, but an opportunity to love. Help us, O oh God, to see in the other your love and your, your image. And we pray, O oh God, for just wisdom for our leaders at all levels, that they would seek hope and peace for their communities. God of all blessings, we give you thanks. We come here today, O oh God, with our own needs, our own struggles, our own places where we need your presence. We lift up to you, O oh God, those places in our lives, those places that we need your hope. We pray for Sandy and Bunny who are entering into your kingdom. We pray for those who need healing. We pray for Kathy we pray for those who need your protection. And we pray for those things and those individuals that we lift up to you now aloud or silently in our hearts at this time. We pray this day for those who grieve. We continue to pray for Terry and Paul. We pray for Marty's family who Marty passed away this past week. We pray for those who are the most vulnerable, those who feel left behind, those who feel as if they are outcast. May your light shine upon them, and may we be instruments of that love. God of all blessings, we give you thanks. Into your hands, O Lord, we commit all for whom we pray, trusting your promises and your love for us and for the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Once again, if you are interested in supporting the ministry here at Hope, you can give electronically at our website, hopeeagle.org, and, and click on the Hope Gives icon. You can also give here in person or through the mail. Again, because hope gives generously, again, we can continue to be a source of hope to so many. So thank you for your generosity and your continued support. I invite you now to join with me as we pray together our Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Hear now these words of our benediction. Go forth from this place inspired to serve one another and empowered by the love of God to do so. Go forth from this place to work in company with all of God's children to do God's work and God's will on earth as it is in heaven. That in love and serving one another, the kingdom of God may come to this world through you and through us. Amen. Our closing song. We're so glad to have you join us in worship today for our closing song. If you'd like, you're welcome to stand and join us in singing.
This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. Your Holy Spirit living in me. This is my daily bread. This is my daily bread Your very word Spoken to me And now I'm desperate for you This is the air I breathe This is the air I breathe Your holy presence Living in me This is my daily breath This is my daily bread, your very word spoken to me. And I, I'm desperate for you. Again, have a blessed week. Be safe and do the work of God that God places before you. Hear those words of our sending. Call by Jesus to go and do likewise. We love, we experience, and we discover God and God's will in the world. And all of God's people said, thanks be to God.